I'm Lorelai. And I am Leah. Welcome on I'm an Equestrian podcast. We founded this podcast two years ago and today we are thrilled to release this new episode in English. In this podcast, we chat with great equestrians and seek to better understand our sport. What is it to be a horseman? What does it cost? What do they dream of? We hope that each of our episodes will participate to strengthen your passion for horses and to empower you as a horse lover, a horse rider and a person. My success will be impossible without him. Here is what Daniel Dosser said about our new guest in an interview given a couple of months ago. Him, Sean Lynch. Sean has been Daniel's groom for the last seven and a half years. He is the one in charge of the horse's health, well-being, safety and so much more. About Killer Queen, Tobago and all of the horses he takes care of, Sean says, I'm their man. Being their man means being on the front line, day after day. Being the one who observes who cares, who does all the morning and night checks, who decides, who drives, who rides. To our question, are grooms rewarded enough for the job? We would all reply, definitely not. But do we really get what is at stake in this job? In this episode, and all along our conversation with Sean, we sure try to get a better picture of his role in Daniel Dusser's performances, but Most of all, we wanted to draw a comprehensive portrait of such a unique and yet tremendous life. We hope you will like this episode, and before we start, we wish to thank Sean for delivering us such an authentic story. Equiresource is a French organization specialized in providing information on recruitment and orientation in the horse sector. It was created in 2007 as a result of a partnership between the Equine Cluster Pôle de Compétitivité Filière Equine, the French Employment Agency, Pôle Emploi, the Regional Council of Normandy, Conseil Régional de Basse Normandie, and the EFCE, Institut Français du Cheval et de l'Équitation. Equiresource provides a free, personalized and committed service to all professionals and future professionals of the sector. Its team offers support to job seekers in finding a training program, a job or an internship in one of the many subsectors of the equine sector. For instance, show jumping, breeding, racing, events, horse trading, health. Equiresource is a team of eight advisors, specialists of the equine sector devoted to provide tailor-made support and help matching employers and candidates. Equiresource in key figures, last year it released over 3,700 job offers and has constantly up to 1,200 open job offers accessible on its website. To achieve its purpose, Equiresource offers a wide range of tools, podcasts, interviews, videos, a career guide, and a list of more than 300 organizations that provide training programs for horse-related jobs. Equiresource also provides detailed information sheets on specific jobs, diplomas and even games or quizzes. Equiresource is also a study center analyzing employment trends and the balance between vocational training and employment in the sector since 2010. It releases, in close collaboration with the actors of the sector, including public and private partners, reports focusing on a wide range of topics. The last report released focuses on the attractivity of jobs in racing stables. Today, our episode features Sean Lynch, showgroom for German top-level rider Daniel Deusser. Groom, yet another career that Equiresource knows very well and promotes through its platform. Last year, more than 100 job offers for grooms based in France or abroad were published on equiresource.fr. If you want to pursue a career in the sector, we warmly recommend you to visit Equiresource website, talk with one of its advisors and start applying for one of the many open positions available on the platform. Hi, Sean. Hi. So I'd like to start this conversation by thanking you. We came here at Stefax Tables um, to meet you and record this episode. And from day one, when we contacted you, you've been very enthusiastic. So thank you for taking time to share your story with us. And thanks for the tour here at the Stables. Schön, you are showgroom for German rider, Daniel Deusser. Today, you're also flat rider, uh, <laughs> yes. as we met you, yeah? You'll talk about that. You've been working alongside Daniel for quite a few years now. You told me seven, seven. Yeah. yeah. You are living this amazing and crazy life, traveling most of your time, flying across the world, driving through Europe, and you dedicate this time, this energy, and this passion to one goal, taking the best care 
of some of the world's most extraordinary athletes, horses. Yeah. Sean, in this episode, we'll try to better understand the fundamentals of your job. But before all, we would like to know who you are. So my first question will be this one. Can you tell us your story and picture a little bit the path that led you here at Stefax Table? Uh, so basically, when I was younger, I was always involved with horses growing up. Um, my grandma actually bought me my first miniature pony when I was younger. Uh, and from then, it's like a drug. It's like a, it's like an addiction. And uh, and I actually rode in England. I rode in the ring a little bit. Uh, I jumped up to 140, 145, like at a national level. But yeah, I, I always enjoyed the sport and enjoyed being around horses. So, and I, I like to look after them as well. And actually, to work for someone like Daniel is... It's like a dream. It's like a dream come true when you think about it. When you watch, you know, you watch the TV when you were younger, and you see Ludger Beerbaum, Mark Hussein, Daniel Doyce, uh, all these big people, and now these big people are part of our family. You know, I was there when Ludger retired from the Nations Cup sport, and it was very. It was a quite an emotional win in Barcelona there, and it's something. It's a drug. It's. I think if you stop this job, it's very difficult to get out of the, the adrenaline rush and the non-stop, no sleep, uh, <laughs> drinking <laughs> coffee and snacks. Uh, yeah. Shen, can you tell us about you, about your personality, and then can you share a little your vision about the qualities that are absolutely necessary and mandatory to do this job with so much passion and, and ambition? I think I have a very good personality. I'm going to be fun. <laughs> um, but I can also be very sassy, you know? I can, little things get to me. And I think it's because we're always on the road and, you know, and I spend so much time with Daniel. He could say good morning to me in the wrong way and I won't speak to him for the rest of the day. But that's just me. And he knows that already now for such a long time. So it's, it's fine. I hope it's fine. Um, to do this job, you have to be dedicated, passionate, sleep deprived. <laughs> um, and you have, to, you have to enjoy what you do and you have to enjoy the horses. Otherwise, you don't, you don't succeed in this life. You can't do this job if you don't like horses. It's, it, it's simple. It's, there's no other explanation. Can you now tell us who you were when you were like about 10 years old of age? Um, what were your dreams when you were a kid? And, um, <laughs> and have you ever thought of becoming the groom, the rider, the professional that you are today? No. <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I actually wanted to be a vet. Ah, okay. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I always told my mum, I think at least once or twice a month, I'm going to be a vet. I'm going to be a vet. And actually, when I was in school, I was very, I say clever. I was very good at all my grades. I, I was very dedicated to school. And then around 15, I didn't want to do school anymore. I hated school. I hated school. I only wanted to do horses. Didn't want to be a vet anymore. Yeah. It went very quickly, very fast. But when I was younger, when I was... Yeah, when I was younger, I wanted to be a vet. But okay, I'm also in this job now working with animals. It's what I love. Have you ever wished you could become a professional rider? No, I'm not good enough. Okay, you knew it. <laughs> yeah, I knew from the beginning. I was, uh, I mean, I enjoyed riding and still now I enjoy to ride on the shows every now and then, uh, or at home like now this week when Daniel's away in Saudi Arabia at the show. Um, I enjoy to ride, but no chance I could be a professional, no. And how did you learn this job? You explained to us that you were at uh, Brian Guthard's tables uh, before, and there are a couple of training centers that have been created over the last years to become a groom. But most of the grooms we met just learned this job on their own. What about you? Correct. When I was 15, 16, I worked weekends for John and Laura Rennick yeah. in England and I would groom and ride. So I would ride a few horses for them and groom and 
this job, it's not, uh, you can't have qualifications to do this job. The only qualifications you need is to be organized, have feeling, and yeah, I mean, love the sport, you know, it's, it's not something you can learn, you know, you learn, you learn by doing, and also this job as well, whether you're 20 or you're 40 and you've been doing it for 20 years, you still learn something new every single day, a different way to close one cut on a horse or cut the horse's mane or there's always something new. Somebody has seen it different and it's not that their way is correct or incorrect. It's everyone has their own system and their own way. And I think that's the only way you can learn to do this job. So you've learned alongside Laura uh, Renrick, yeah. right? And then did you go directly straight to Florida? No, I actually worked for Ellen Whitaker. I worked for Ellen Whitaker a little bit. And then I also stopped horses for almost two years. What did you do? I was a restaurant manager. Okay. okay. I did that close to home. I was in between debating if I do this job or not do this job. And I worked in a restaurant. Very, very busy restaurant, very successful restaurant, very busy, now I think about it. But again, it was the same crazy hours, not so many time for yourself or anything. And then I went to Brian to America, uh, worked a little bit there. And here I am now at Stefik, seven years later. So you decided to come back with horses? Yeah. It's Why? a drug. It's, okay. it's, <laughs> even when I stopped to do the job, I would always look at the results from the big shows. It was in the middle of the summer. I would look at the Nations Cup from Hickstead, Dublin. I was always watching the results. And I think at one point you, you miss the life, you know. You, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy how you can miss something so much, I think. How many shows do you attend each year? Like <laughs> 49, 50? Uh, when it's a normal year with no corona. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say between 45 and 50. Yeah. So we know how energy consuming and demanding is the job of showroom. Being away most of the time, waking up very, very early in the morning and finishing your days very late, especially in winter uh, with the indoor season like Geneva last, mm -hmm. last week. Um, do you ever find yourself weary in this life? What do you mean by this? Like, do you ever feel bored or um, you don't want to do that anymore? Like, you, you know, you, you feel... I think people go through that stage. I know for sure when Corona first happened and there was the lockdown, I started to really uh, think about life a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's something... Uh, it's not something that can, you know, happen like that. That's something, you know, we talked with uh, Grégory Watley yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we met him in his sables and um, we talked about that with uh, other writers also, like uh, Jérôme Guéry, I think, um, that the pandemic and we talked about how this one-of-a-kind event impacted the way professionals of the equine industry work. You know, the constellations of shows and the time spent at home, uh, it felt like a precedent, I think. Grigory said that at some point he was enjoying it so much that it felt almost wrong to have to go back to the show. Um, <laughs> how did you experience this period? Can you relate to that, to what he said? I think the, the difference was because everybody was in the same situation. It wasn't like the rider was hurt and you were staying at home and missing out on anything. Everybody was in the same situation. Everybody was at home not going to shows, having a normal seven to five day. I quite enjoyed the Corona time. It was quite nice. I actually created an app while I was at home as well to make groom's life a little bit easier with layover stables, links to the show, things to do for your first, first flight, a uh, little a step guide kind of thing. Um, I did all of this and this was actually quite fun. Actually, it took me a couple of months to do this. So this was fun, but it was nice to get back to the shows. It was, It was nice to not have home cooked meals and it was nice to be on the road again. It was at one point I was Googling which food to make next because it was so <laughs> there was so many dinners we had to make. Uh, in the end, we had to uh, I had to Google what to make next. I don't know, Sean, if you will agree to talk about this with us, but I want to ask you about your private life. 
how do showrooms find the right balance between professional and personal life when we know how difficult it is to have some time to enjoy your life and is it even really possible? It's a very good question actually. It doesn't happen so often. Unfortunately, and unfortunately, you know, <laughs> we're away a lot, like you say, we're home Monday, Tuesday, maybe. The Monday is the washing, sleeping, ready for the next trip. Tuesday is packing and Wednesday we leave again. And I think that's why you see some of the good showrooms, they start to slow down or they start to, you know, they start to think about life. For sure, I've also done the same as well. You know, I had a partner already for the last one and a half year. We're not together anymore. And it's a shame that we don't see each other enough. You know, it's, it's one of them things. It's, I don't think you can, unless there is somebody on the shows that still does the same job as you and you live close together. I know two of my good friends that work for Good Riders, they're on the show together every week and they make it work for the last seven years and it's fine, but it's very difficult. And nobody really out of the horse sport understands the life. They don't understand why you started work at seven o'clock and Uh, the one horse is colicking yeah but okay you don't need to you can leave the state you know it's things like this you know you can't there is a, a very difficult balance and i think at one point it makes people think for sure me yeah i'm 31 now it's not old but at one point i would like to think about a family my own house you know okay we have it good here at stefx we have all our own apartments every groom has their own apartment so we're all private from the stable but still i mean it's At one point, I think it, if you don't think about it, it's, yeah, it's a difficult subject, actually. It's, I mean, I didn't see my mum for, I don't even know how long. I got home for Christmas now, which is quite nice, which is the first time in 10 years. Uh, my best friend at home has had two children since I was away last. That's how long ago I went back to England. It's, it, it's, you love this job and you love this life. And then you kind of miss everything else you know, like weddings. And I've been to one wedding in my life and I'm 31 years old. <laughs> and that was Danny Goldstein's because we managed to make it work in between shows. But I mean, apart from that, it's, I think it's very difficult. Very, very difficult. You just said when we met in your sables over there um, that you're flying to Florida uh, beginning of January. And uh, we wanted to know, um, so it's been I think a couple of years that you fly to Florida to stay a few weeks uh, at the Winter Equestrian Festival in Wellington. How's life in Wellington and how different is it compared to Europe? I mean, for you as a groom, but also for horses and riders. Okay, last year was very different because of Corona. There wasn't so much happening. Everything was canceling. All the World Cups started to cancel. We had, I think, seven horses there for Daniel and also seven for Zoe. And we'd gone from here where there was no restaurants, no bars, no life, to Florida where you wore the mask, but you still went to the disco, you still went to the restaurants, you still did normal things, you know? And it's, I must admit, I really like Florida. It's hard, it's hard work. I take five horses this year and it's not like five horses in Saint-Tropez. It's completely different. You have horses in the quarantine, you have horses at home, you have horses at the show. It's, You have to be very organized there. You have to be very, but I think the, the horses enjoy it. They get to be in the sunshine a little bit. And I mean, I can wear shorts in February, <laughs> so I'm more than happy to go there also. It's, it's nice. And now we have our own stable there now. Stefan just buy one stable there with accommodation and everything. So I think it's going to be fun this year. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a little bit stressful because it's our own place. And, you know, it's, it's like here, everything needs to, you know, he wants everything good and tidy because we have a good reputation. I think it's going to be stressful, but I'm excited. We had a good season last year as well. He won good Grand Prix, good 150 classes. So I'm hoping we can do the same again this year. All the other riders with tall twists acknowledge the fact that their grooms play a significant role in their performance. Can you tell us a little bit about this role and how important is your job? I think, I think Daniel would agree as well. The trust, you have to have a lot of trust. I could leave to one show and I don't speak to him for two or three days. I drive all night, 12 hours, arrive at the show, make everything ready. Uh, me and da Daniel's wife calls us an old married couple because we're, <laughs> we're together every week on the show and we spend so much time together. I know him so well, you know, when he comes out of the ring, I know when the face is straight, 
I don't speak to him. I leave him alone and he comes later and he speaks to me about the round. I think there has to be a lot of trust also with me to him and him to me. I think it's very important when you look at the horses you have on the truck, like I could go to the show with Killer Queen and Tobago and that's already, I don't know how many millions in the back of the truck. And you sit there at night and you drive and you look at the clock and you're like, oh, I still have 600 kilometers to go and it's two o'clock in the morning. I work all day, but there's something in the head that makes you go, okay, I'm their person and I have to make sure that they get there safely and they have to get there good. And I'm always the first person to freak out if one's sick. I think that's also to do with first class because when he collect and he passed away, I, it's always in the back of my mind that, you know, something bad's going to happen. And yeah, I think you have to be a really, yeah, it's, it's very important, the job to look after these horses. Daniel said, I will quote him, my success will be impossible without him. And the press article title was, Daniel Dusser credits groom Sean Lynch in his rise to the top. Do you think that the role of grooms as an integral element of riders' performance, just like the one of home riders, has evolved over time? Do you believe that riders and broad public grant enough consideration to both grooms and rider jobs? I think somebody paid Daniel to say that. <laughs> I'm 100% no, sure. I don't know. I think it's a, it's a very big team effort. You have to have a good show groom, home rider, home groom. It takes a village to run a stable, a professional stable, to have the horses good, in fit condition. Also the blacksmith, the vet, everybody. If I understand the question correctly, I don't think... The grooms get so much acknowledged. Like they see the rider, and that's all. You know, is this from riders or from broad public that they do not get enough consideration, according to you? I think a bit fifty-fifty. I think like the public, they see the rider and they see, like you say, for instance, Arken. The horse was double clear on the Nations Cup. Germany go crazy because we're in Germany. Uh, everything's amazing, but they don't realize that we then have two and a half hours work afterwards with the ice in the massage blanket the clay all of this and then on sunday to come out and the horse is amazing again and wins the grand prix to then think oh that groom actually has three hours work probably three hours to drive home and then to go to saint tropez the next day to unpack repack like when i came home from arken it was midnight i unpacked the truck i repacked the shavings the hay the saddle pads the food everything ready for Saint-Tropez because I was leaving the next morning to Saint-Tropez. And I don't think people understand so much or give enough credit to the grooms for what we do. You know, it's, I think the people inside the horse sport understand, some of them, not everybody. But I would say, yeah, I don't think the grooms are acknowledged as much as they should be. And what about the duo rider-groom? How do you guys make it happen to the top? You said it was about trust, but what else do you need? Like, what's the recipe? Yeah, one, I, again, one thing is definitely trust. I think me and Daniel are both very motivated. Like, if he has a not a good round, like in Geneva, when I was videoing in Geneva and it was the Grand Slam and there was all eyes on Daniel, I'm pretty sure somebody pulled out my heart when she had the fence down. The whole week was building up to this and also in the top 10 when she stopped in the top 10 in the second <laughs> round. This was unexpected. You know, and I think if you both don't have drive and ambition and, and want to do good all the time, then I don't think it works so well. Can you understand what happened in her mind? Like, she stopped. We don't know why. Like, do everything I, was Dan perfect. Daniel also doesn't know. But it's not the, it's not the first. But okay, she's also a mayor. She has a very strange temperament. She already kicked me before, uh, did the ligaments in my knee in one show. Uh, Steph X Master, she kicked me at the boot check and opened, I had blood everywhere. And then one week she'll be an angel. She's, she's the most perfect animal ever. But her mind sometimes, if she wakes up and she, she has a bad day, she has a bad day. I think that's why we get on so well. Maybe because Daniel said, good morning, in the wrong in, way. In the wrong That's way. That's what it was. Yeah, Probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you. Yeah, no, uh, I know. He, he also, we spoke about the top 10 final second round all the weekend and none of us have a, a theory of why it happened. 
And how is Daniel? Can you describe the rider, the workmate, and the man he is? Joyce, uh, he is a great horseman. He always wants to be better than he can, which I think, I know he's my rider, but I think he's one of the best riders in the world. I think he's incredible. He can be funny sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> he is German. Uh, he can be funny sometimes. And he, not that he says it a lot, but like the thing there where he says, you know, my success wouldn't be possible without him. He does have a heart somewhere. <laughs> no, he's, he's super. I get, on, I get on with him very well. We fight like a married couple, but um, yeah, I wouldn't want to work for anybody else. I think he's amazing at what he does. I don't think there's any rider like him that can ride these horses to the level and to the victories that he does. You must have learned a lot, you know, uh, collected a lot of experience working alongside such a rider. Yeah, that's for sure. And he reminds me a lot as well. When, when I forget something, he reminds me that <laughs> <laughs> he is my boss. Um, and he refers to the days that he was at Franka Slutak's place. Uh, he did this to me two weeks ago when we was at a national show, because we don't go to national shows very often. And he reminded me that when he was younger and he went to a national show and it was cold, he just did the job because I was complaining because it was cold. Um, no, there, there's been a lot of things, you know, and I ask him as well, you know, like sometimes I'll ask him, why do you put this bridle or why do you have this bit today or why do we change this bit now? And he has a lot of knowledge. He's, he's very clever and yeah, he's an incredible horseman. What are the emotions that you go through every week at the show? Can be after a victory, as the one you wrapped with Daniel and Killer Queen this uh, year in Aachen, but also when things don't go as expected. Do you manage to take a step back on what happens? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, in Aachen I cried like a baby. The, I was very emotional. When I realized that he'd won, I was away from the ring. I went to a second collector ring to stay by myself. And then everybody started screaming and I looked at the, looked at the TV and I see that the guy was slower and I, I, I couldn't stop crying. It was very emotional. Dad was very emotionally drained. And when things don't go great, it depends. Sometimes I, I don't speak. I go very quiet. I think it's because, you know, we spend 24-7 with these horses and you always want like every groom at the, the jump, uh, the five stars every week, you always want to win, you know? And uh, for me, especially, I, I, I want nothing more than Daniel to be number one in the world all the time. And when something doesn't go right, I question, did I do this good? Or did I miss something? Or did I put the boots on wrong? Because it's always me that does the boots. So I think, did I put them too tight? Or did I put them too, you know, I, did I do this wrong? Or did I put the right girth on today? Because Killer Queen and Tobago have their, I know which girth is theirs. And, They have like a little mark on the front. Did I put the wrong one on? And I'm very superstitious. Did I put odd plaits or did I plait too far? You know, and I start going crazy in the head. But um, yeah, I would like to win every week. I would have loved to have win last week. That would have been a nice win. It happens. Next week. As I already mentioned it, we were with Gregory Watla yesterday and he confessed that traveling to some of the best places in the world, like Geneva last week, for example, being offered so much lust everywhere um, always uh, makes him remember that he does not belong to this world. He said that he does love this life and definitely make the most of it. But in the end, when he comes home and shares the football games with his neighbors in the village he has grown up, It's eventually what he prefers and where he gets the highest sense of belonging. Can you relate to that? You're also traveling, you're living in Florida, you're going yeah. to Geneva, you're, you know. I think it's very different for me because my family's not here, you know, so I can't relate to it as such. But, you know, say for instance, like I go to the, normally I go to the five star shows every week. But when I go to a two star, I enjoy it so much. It's so nice. It's so less stressful. It's. I don't plat horses. They go and jump a 140 and I'm so happy. <laughs> It's, I don't start shaking with the camera because Killer Queen's come into the triple combination of Arkan and it's nice. It's, I think it reminds you where you came from and you know, like the national show in Lear a couple of weeks ago and there was 170 horses in the class and you don't enjoy it, but then it makes you realize 
10 years ago, I did this. And if I didn't do this, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be working for one of the best riders in the world and working with the best horses in the world. If you don't start somewhere, you can't go forward in your career. You can't just expect to jump into a five-star job. You know, it's, I think that the smaller shows and the national shows, they bring you back down a little bit, like a football game with your local friends, you know, you, it brings you back down to make you realize that actually, this is what I did when I was younger and it makes you feel a bit normal sometimes. Shen, if I ask you to keep one unique memory of your career, this can be as a groom for Daniel or any other rider, what memory is it? Olympic Games Rio 2016. Okay. Winning the bronze medal for the team. A week I will never forget, ever. It gives me goosebumps to think about it. When we did the jump off with Canada, something, uh, yeah, it's to win a medal at the Olympics, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, that would. Was it stressful? Was it, you know, what have you been through during this week in Rio? Actually, it wasn't stressful. I was more stressed in Arken. Uh, Rio was quite nice. It was, it wasn't so stressful. The only time I got a little bit stressed was when I had Daniel's wife behind me, Stefan to the other side of me, and then Otto Becker just behind them, all screaming because of the medal. That was the only time I got stressed, and I dropped the camera into the, um, into the ring. <laughs> so when you watch the video back, he goes through the finish, Stefan shakes me, and the camera leaves. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only stressful part of Rio. Yeah, that's a topic we talked with a lot of riders and with Grigory, but also with Kevin and, you know, Olympics, the Olympics, it's another world. It's a competition like no other. Can you, as a groom, feel that? Oof. Yeah, <laughs> yes, for sure. It's not like a Europeans or it's, it's not anything like a nation's cup or anything like this. The Olympics, I think is one of the most special things to do, to represent, okay, Daniel represents the country, but to be his person, to represent his country as well. I actually got in the post yesterday, a Team Germany, Tokyo participator, because I was part of Team Germany. Uh, no, it's something. And do you feel like you're supporting Daniel? Do you feel like you're supporting a country? The team. The team, the team so sure. you're British? And no. No, you're Irish. No, I'm British. You're Br Okay. But, okay, like when Ben won with Explosion, I was very much British that day. Very, very British. But for sure, when you're there to do something, you know, you, you support the Germans. You're, you're rooting for them to make sure that they're in the team, they're clear, and you want to be on the podium with them. Or It's definitely a team thing. What will the future look like, Shen? We already stated it, this job is very demanding and most grooms eventually take an exit and pursue another career after having worked so hard for a couple of years to, or decades, like Maud Liguza, the former groom of Philippe Rosier. Yeah. Others like Bosti's groom, Claudius, for instance, have been sticking to their career and their rider for years now. What about you? Can you or will you continue this journey uh, for another while? For now, yes. Uh, when Daniel asked, it was our seven year anniversary a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. <laughs> and when he was on the phone to me, I just arrived in Verona and he was like, oh, happy seven years. You make another seven? I was like, uh, I think so. I'm not sure. <laughs> Honestly, with this job, you can't decide where you are in five years. I mean, who knows? Daniel might give up tomorrow and stop this job. You know, I, I've not saying he is, but you never know, you know, it's not like you work in a, in a supermarket or something and in five years you want to stop the supermarket, you want to do something different and it's something, you, I don't know, you can't really explain it. Someone sent me a picture today actually and it said, where do you see yourself in five years? And the reply was, and underneath was a reply saying, I'm just trying to see until Friday. Mm -hmm. this, I this, saw that. This, I saw my, that. This is my life. <laughs> I saw that. This, this is our life too. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. sent to all of my groom friends and they all replied laughing. So yeah, I think ideally I would like to slow down at one point and not do all the shows. Obviously I would still, if I could, very much like to go with Killer Queen or Tobago. 
and maybe manage a little bit and stay at home, whether that be here or somewhere else. I don't know, but right now, right now I'm happy. One question I haven't asked you yet, but uh, because I forgot, but um, I'm just reminding it right now. You just said uh, when we were in the stables um, with the horses that you were handling Daniel's social networks. That's quite unusual for groups, right? Yes. <laughs> it's not in my contract. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, it, I mean, it's me that's always on the show. It's me that in the beginning, when I first started at Cefex, we would always have to send pictures to a social media group and then they would upload them where it's always me that's on the show. So I don't mind to do it. I mean, I anyway take pictures for my Instagram or take, I mean, my phone is probably full of, I don't know how many pictures from an aeroplane or a container or the back of a truck or three o'clock in the morning still driving. I have that access. So to upload a photo and write write what, he need, what needs to be written. It doesn't take two minutes for me. So I don't mind to do it, actually. Okay, one last question, I promise. We asked you about life in Florida, but uh, we haven't asked you about life in Stefax because the place, I could not even describe it. That's incredible. Um, it was my second time here and Leah, well, it was your first time. It's your first time and that's amazing. Like there's no word to say, how is it for you to live and work in such a place and in such a team also? I think it's very, it's very horse friendly here. You know, we have everything. We have lunch pens, walkers, spas, aqua trainers, paddocks, enough rings to ride everywhere racetracks he we also have a forest across the street as well so the horses can go for a nice hack in the woods and everything to be a bit normal for a week or a calm down week it's definitely got bigger here it's crazy here actually where we are now is the new part of stefex uh, i say new part it's just up the at the end of stefex um, we're up there with two clients and actually i must say I, i get on very well with everybody at stefex but i don't really see them enough Tonight I actually have dinner because I'm home this week. So it's a normal week. I can go, I can put normal clothes on, no more riding pants. Uh, I'm going to wear a shirt and <laughs> do my hair. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a big family here, and okay, not everybody gets on with everybody, but that's normal when you have uh, 25 grooms and 10 riders here. It's also completely normal. But we try to do things together. Like now I'm just in the middle of planning something for New Year that we all have drinks together or something. So we're not all in the apartment because obviously we can't go anywhere or do anything at the moment. It's interesting to see different people come in. If I, Yeah. Like when I started here seven years ago, we shared houses and there was a lot of French people here. Hence why I can speak a little bit of French. And I work also with a, my home groom is French and my home rider before, Ben, was also French. Um, and now I must say it's changed a lot. Now everybody has their own apartment. They have their own space for when they finish at five o'clock, they go home. They don't have to share a house with anybody. And there's a lot of Swedish here now and a few English, which I like because then people understand me a little bit better. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's great. And everybody roots for you as well, you know, like at the Olympics. The minute Killer Queen jumped clear the first day, every single person at set, we have a group also from all the grooms and the flat riders in, everybody was going crazy. Oh my God, I'm so happy for you. And every single person at Cefex would send a message. And it's, not, it's nice. And like when we won Arkan, the phone went completely crazy with everybody from here with the party emojis and champagne and yeah, everyone went crazy. But yeah, it's... It's different here, that's for sure. It's different to what I'm, I say I'm used to. I'm used to it now. I've been here seven years. But before I was always in a smaller stable and, you know, it was a home groom, a home rider and a show groom. And that was it. You know, it wasn't here. We have eight show riders plus clients. You know, it's, it's a big operation. That's for sure. But when you see it here, you can't. The place is incredible. You couldn't want for anything with the trucks that we have to... The apartments we have, I have a very nice apartment, so I'm very happy about this. So <laughs> I can speak about my apartment for <laughs> days. In another, in another episode. <laughs> yeah, in another so we can speak just about my apartment, that's fine. <laughs> Not the job anymore, just the apartment. So yeah, it's, you know, and even the people in the office, you know, they all know you there well enough. 
the the lady that's in charge of the credit cards and the main guy of the trucks who makes a bet with you if you win Arc and Grand Prix, you can get a new truck. Nice. Accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a new truck coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was the deal. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy here, but if you don't, if you're not a little bit crazy, and you can't do this job, I don't think. Also. So that's why you've been working here for so long. Yes, there's only two of us that are here the longest. Okay. One is ten years, and I'm seven years. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. No Thank you, Sean. No worries. Thank you.